Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, we're going to be returning this evening, finally, back to the book of Hebrews. And I can't remember the last time I preached on it, but there's been five messages so far. Um, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, we'll read from verse 10 onwards. In, pre- in preparation for this sermon, I remember I was concentrating a lot on verses 10, 11, and 12 finding it difficult to almost have the verses kind of biting. So eventually it kind of dawned on me about a week or two ago how to take this. Spurgeon said he would not preach on a passage until it really gripped him. And I pray that there's a danger in just preaching for any length of time to go through the motions and just through, I pray that it is the, the Lord speaking through this message. We just bow our heads in a word of prayer first. Father, O oh Lord, as we come before you this day, we thank you, Lord, what a privilege it is to, to worship you in your house. Father, there's, there's so many distractions in our day. And Lord, I pray that we would see none of the hands of men at work here, but we would see the risen Savior. Oh Lord, that you would enable me, but you would also bless all those that are here. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen us in the most holy faith. In Jesus' name we now pray. Amen. Amen. So we'll read from Hebrews chapter 1 verse 10 to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old as does the garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them? Who shall be heirs of salvation? Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own will. And today's message is going to be entitled, Eternal Consequences. Eternal Consequences. All of our actions have consequences. They can be good, they can be bad. We... Consequences can vary in severity. They can be temporal. Or they can be irreversible. The consequences we are talking about in these verses, once that time comes to die and face the judgment, those consequences are irreversible. Remember years ago, I don't often give personal illustrations, but this will be the first time. I was 16 years old, and I was traveling along on a bike. And I was keeping in from my car behind me. And I was probably going too quick. And I went over the handlebars and knocked out most of my front teeth. I still remember that morning. I still remember looking in the mirror, and I remember the consequence of me going too fast was I will never have natural front teeth from what here to here is false. At the time, being vain, it was devastating. But now, they're just teeth. 
But the illustration is this. It's irreversible. There's, it, while these things, they're all vain, it doesn't really matter. These things are temporal. But once it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Once we stand there, we must give an account. All men, whether in Christ or not, will answer for their actions. When in the Christian life there are consequences of their temporal ones. If we make bad decisions as Christians, it will affect others. If we allow sin into our lives and allow the corruption of sin into our lives, unfortunately it all always ends up dragging others with them. There's also consequences to our own lives. The wisdom that comes, and what I'm trying to do here is compare the things that are temporal with the things that are eternal. Our minds, unfortunately, can never fully comprehend that. Take the largest ocean in the world. You take a tiny drop of water as being our entire lifespan, it still does not come close to representing what is eternity. Eternity is not just simply time going on and on. It is the absence of time. As Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 says, To every thing there is a season and a time, and every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, and so on and so forth. As we grow in our Christian walk, I feel there's one thing that often, often we can tell if we're mature enough, we can tell what the Bible forbids and what the Bible allows. What we often do is, we do not, as I've written here, with not enough wisdom, we covet something before it's actually ours. Knowing the right timing. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. For what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Much more important than the things you will lose in this world. What if you lose your own soul? The Puritans were wise enough to realize, regardless of how big their congregation or small the congregation, no matter how long somebody was attending church, it did not mean that everybody was necessarily saved. What happens in eternity depends on how you stand before this man, Christ Jesus. Our high priest, has he declared you cleansed? Or are you still a spiritual leper? Still a stench and offense before the, a holy and just God. And what I hope to do in verse 10, verses 10 to 12 and verse 13 and 14 is to show the one in who, before whom we have sinned. In verses 1 to 3, it talks about God speaking in various manners. Then, speaking then of how Christ sat down in the right hand of majesty on high. This man, using pronouns here, purged by himself our sins. Then in verses 4 to 7, talks about his excellency in comparison with the angels and then 8 and 9 talks about his kingdom and his scepter and his glory and how he loves righteousness and hates iniquity continues here verse 10 for thou lord in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thine hands not only I think often, especially when we're young Christians, we're going at various... For a long time, we will have false views of the Trinity until they're corrected. It's all, almost like we've got this notion of the Father creating, and the Son coming to die, and then the Spirit kind of doing everything else. But no, no, no. The Father created, the Son created, and so did the Spirit. It talks about in Genesis chapter 1... How 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You see, <clears throat> there's so much in that one sentence. Even the English word universe simply means one sentence. God spoke the universe into existence. In the beginning, time came into existence. God created the heaven and the earth. Time, space, and matter. God did not need anything from anyone. He was completely self-sufficient, self-reliant, and created this earth out of his own good pleasure. And the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. It shows how creation is Trinitarian. Imagine this. The God who from all eternity existed took upon himself. He became man. He humbled himself. He disrobed, as some commentators say, of his outward vestments of his glory. Still equally glorious. But he entered. He humbled himself. He came into the sin-cursed world and died a criminal's death on a hill he created himself. He created everything. We rejected everything he gave us. And yet he still came into the sin-cursed world and died for people who never sought after him. He is eternal. And as you can see here, Thou, Lord, for all the enemies of the deity of Christ, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the world. He was there at the beginning. When we sin, we sin against Him, the Creator. The one who created it all has the right to make all the decisions and rule according to His own glory. But what do we do? We turn it around and we worship the creation. We turn everything, we corrupt it on its head. And rather than worshipping the source of all life, the source of all truth, we worship what He's created. We'll find anything else besides God to worship. Turn to Romans one twenty six. Romans one twenty six states, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change. That's a verse twenty seven, maybe. Um, oh yeah, verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. And notice what God says after this. For this cause there is judgment upon all these things. And there's a, quite a big long list. And I think sometimes when we read the end of Romans chapter 1, the thing that stands out to us in this modern day seems to be only the issue of homosexuality. God gave them up to vile affections. God gave them up to be, to not retain God in their knowledge. Gave them up to a reprobate mind for putting the creation above the creator. God, Christ, Jesus Christ, is our eternal creator. Verse 11. They shall perish. He's speaking about the heavens and the earth. But thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth the garment. I don't know about you, but you ever notice some of your favorite clothes have holes in them? And it breaks your heart when it does happen. Because you want to keep wearing them forever. And usually it's the worst clothes that you have. And you, you never want to wear them. They're in perfect condition for a long time. That's another issue. But clothes wear away. Everything in this earth wears away. And it's interesting because the scriptures don't use illustrations of iPads or 
smartphones or anything like that. They didn't exist back then, but they used things that people needed. Clothes, those remain. They wax old. The, even the, you see, some of the biggest cults in the world worship the heavens and the earth. They, Gaia worship, you can go on and on. They worship the temporal creation, but this will wax old. It will fade away. It's temporal. And while, yes, we should take care of it, but that's always twisted into worshipping that thing. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Christ is everlasting. He will outlast all the inventions of men. He will outlast all things in this earth. Anything you have clung to your possession that you are unwilling to give up, realize it's going to perish. It will wax old as doth the garment. And as, in the same way, you'll have to throw out those old things. You'll have to throw... All these things will go in the trash. All these things will be burnt up. But what will remain? God will remain. James 4.14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. When people are young, if you're in your teens or if you're in your 20s, you feel like you're going to live forever. You don't feel like you're going to die. You will. And it's very short. And it's a vapor, and a, a vapor, I don't know if you've ever seen water evaporate, just a vapor, just, it's gone. Mm. And often what we do, in, while we're in this vapor, we start chasing other vapors. Mm. And it's useless. And the satisfaction from such things lasts just as long. Mm. But Christ is everlasting. That should comfort the believer. Verse 12. And as a vesture, vesture is a sort of veil, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. So I want to stop there for a second. As a vesture is a veil, thou shalt fold them up. Notice who's doing the folding up. Not only will they wear away, not only will they not last, God's going to fold them up. Christ will fold them up. Mm. See, it's not just that these things are outside of the control of Christ. We have to realize sometimes, yes, we must make much of Christ's humanity, but we must make much of Christ's divinity. Mm. And I feel sometimes we can make much of his humanity by also diminishing his, his divinity. Christ is not your buddy, he's your Lord. He will fold them up. Notice how if you're folding up towels or sheets or anything like that, how easy it is. But this is how it is for God. He is all powerful. And they shall be changed by the power of God. Notice that it is never outside of God's control. Isaiah 46 verses 9 to 11. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all, not just some, I won't attempt to, I'll do all my pleasure. Calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have proposed it. I will also do it. It's quite different to the God of the Arminians. God's tapping at the, on your heart. He will perform it. And anything that is in this world that he created, he will fold it up. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth one day. It will wax old. 
while there is nothing wrong with having possessions, but are you using for them for the glory of God? He is in control. He's the reason you have those possessions in the first place. Are you using them for the glory of God? And here's the thing. These things have consequences. To be unfaithful in little. And it's why people often want so many responsibilities so quickly. But yet cannot be responsible in small things. If you can't be responsible with little things, you can't be responsible for bigger things. We often have this thing in our mind, if only I had that job, I'd be much more responsible. It's false. It's a lie from the devil. You have to be, if you're not going to be content with little things, if you're not, then the devil will flood you with ideas, grandeur, feed your flesh. Because Christ grants you all these things, all these temporal privileges you have. Colossians 1.17, by him all things consist. And all things are by him and for him. All things consist. That word consists. He holds it all together. Holds it all together. There's not this, again, we have a false understanding of who Christ is in the church. He's almost become like our butler. And again, that has eternal consequences. If the, the God you worship, the God that's often worshipped in most professing churches, is a God who, regardless of what you ask Him for, almost like, you know, ring the bell, He comes running to you, then he is a figment of your imagination. He serves you. He serves your own imagination. Because why he, ser- he suits you. But the truly born again Christian, that one, he, he or she seeks after, what is thy will? And if my heart is not pleasing before you, Lord, change it. Mm-hmm. Verse... Second half of verse 12. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Christ is immutable. Yesterday, today, forever. Probably one of the most misused verses in the Bible. But what it really means is Christ is eternal. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In that he's always been God. He always will be God. And he always. That will never change. What it does not mean. Is that many of the Old Testament practices. Are still in effect. Or any other. um, First century charismatic gifts. Where it's often used in that context. These things brethren. And I think we can often skip over them. Prove Christ's deity. He's immutable. He does not change. And the thing about it is, on one hand, that is incredibly comforting to the Christian. Could you imagine a God who is as indecisive as we are? That would be terrifying. Well, am I saved today? Am I saved tomorrow? Maybe he doesn't like me anymore. He's immutable. If you're in Christ, that does not change. Christ said on the cross, it is finished. <clears throat> Paid in full to Telestai. Not potentially. It's not like some kind of a bounce check. He paid it in full. Everything required on behalf of those who would ever believe. All those who would ever come to faith in Christ, he paid it for. It's incredibly comforting in one aspect to the Christian. But it's devastating to the person who does not know Christ. Why do I say that? If you're corrupt in your heart, if you love corruption, then that is a person who loves the deeds of his own flesh, loves the idols of his own heart, he will want a corrupt judge. You don't want a just judge. You don't want to go before him. Why would you want to go before a just judge? 
If you are corrupt in your own heart, your heart's been never regenerated, you'd never love the things of God, and you'd never want the things of God, you want a corrupt judge. Why? So you can be let off. You want that. But here's the thing. In the same way his moral law, summarized in the Ten Commandments, his eternal law, never changes. The standards never change. The requirements never change. It doesn't change in the Old Covenant. It didn't change in the New Covenant. The same requirements are always there. Comforting for the Christian. Devastating for the non-Christian. If he understands it. God will judge righteously. Same, same standard. There isn't this idea that God will accept our sincerity and just in some way halfway. <laughs> The law must be perfectly fulfilled. And people will ask the right question then. Who can fulfill this? No one but Christ. He is our unchanging priesthood. He is the high priest interceding before the Father. He's immutable. And then finally, verses 13 and 14, before we get into our conclusion of the Apostles' argument... Christ is unique. He is above all. And the apostle, when he's writing here, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit in my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Now these are questions not to be answered. It's like, well, I know the answer to that. No. This is who but Christ And why, again, like verses 4 to 7, why use the angels as a comparison? Why say which of the angels? Because they are the most powerful, most incredible beings outside of the Godhead. There's, no, there's nothing else you could compare God with that could be possibly, and still, to a certain extent, it's still like comparing a worm with a man, but they are the most incredible beings the Hebrews knew about them they knew exactly often there was worship of them you see in the Old Testament at times people would bow before them and some of the angels would correct them and say worship God alone if we look at this sit in my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool the consequences are dire to be Christ's enemy. If you are outside of Christ, you are Christ's enemy. He will make his enemies his footstool. See, we've painted Christ in the modern church as this go-to for counseling help. And yes, you can come to him. Come unto me all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from your burdens, rest from your attempts, religious attempts to make yourself right. But not rest in your hypocrisy. If you want to repent before God, be honest with Him. I think one of the biggest problems with people when they're repenting, they're not being honest. Or attempting to repent. Verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits? Send forth. And also it says, send forth. These powerful, incredible, created beings. They're sent forth. They, okay, who shall be heirs of salvation. He sends them forth. They go. They don't question the order. He controls all of nature and it obeys Him. And what do we say when He asks us to go and do something? That's too difficult. Or, no. It is an astonishment of the... It, is a, it shows the mercies of God that He does not crush us like an ant. Mm -hmm. Because we, we do not deserve anything else. The conclusion of the argument. 
with all these things in mind, with all these things in mind, God is our eternal, Christ is our eternal creator. He's everlasting. He will outlast everything. He's sovereign, immutable. He's unique. He's above all the angels, more powerful. He orders them. In conclusion to that, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Because of all these things, because of all these truths of who Christ is, because of who you have sinned against. This is why it's so important to study the attributes of God. Who Christ is. Because if you don't see against who you have sinned, how can you feel any sense of remorse? To know the immense, the inestimable value of Christ will drive you to repentance if you're truly converted. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. There's a warning there. Because of these things, therefore, it was one of the main reasons I felt these things must be put together. Therefore, we should, we ought, we must. Earnest, the more earnest heed to the things which you've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. What should we do? And there's two opposites. Earnestly heeding what we've heard or letting them slip. Are you meditating upon the truths of Scripture? Are you heeding to what Scripture tells you? Because if we do not meditate upon these things, they're quite like, it's like a broken bucket with water leaking out. Our brains are quite like that. Mm -hmm. Matthew Henry, let's get the quote here. Matthew Henry comments on these verses when he states that, For the great loss we shall sustain if we do not take this earnest heed to things which we have heard. We shall let them slip. This is what he says here. They will leak. And run out of our heads, of our lips, lives, and we shall be great losers by our neglect. Mm -hmm. Brethren, if you see somebody backsliding, or if you yourself are backsliding, it did not happen the time you fell. Yeah. It happened long before that. It had happened when you spend more time in the things of the world. It spent, happened when you spend more time watching films or whatever else you were doing and not in the Word. Because... Mm -hmm. These things, they slipped, they leaked out of your head. They ran out of your head's lips. And, and it'll start to happen as soon as you think, as soon as you're doing pretty well. It's been 30 days since I did that. I feel quite good. I'm good. And you start trusting yourself. More than you did the past month. And sometimes I even think maybe the devil probably even kind of goes, I'll step back for a minute, he's doing plenty for me. He just... You know, once we start trusting in our own hearts, these things will leak, run out of our heads, our lips, our lives. Notice how he says run. And they seem dramatic when you see them happen before you. But they were quite gradual. Never put anything before the truth of God's word. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're family or so-called friends. He says, learn when we have received the gospel truths into our minds, we are in danger of letting them slip. Our minds and memories are like a leaky vessel. They do not, without much care, retain what is poured into them. And I just want to stop there. Poured into them. We spend mo so much time on the things of this world, but how much time do we spend... In the things of Christ, in His Word. We expect instant results when we put nothing in. If we put the amount of time into God's Word as we did to a day job, how long would we be in that job? May God forgive us. We have two extent. 
Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. Let's look at the blessed man. Blessed is a man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Notice how he's avoiding things. Notice how he does not stand with sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He's rejecting one, but his delight is in something else. His delight is in the law of God. In the law doth he meditate day and night. This is what it means to take diligent heed to the things you've learned. It doesn't matter if you spend 15 minutes in the Word of God in the morning. That is not enough. Meditate day and night. We put physical food above spiritual food when we do that. How often do we feed ourselves physically? And how often do we feed ourselves spiritually? Every opportunity we can get for a work and a break, we should get along with God as much as possible. And if you're in front of everybody and you've got your Bible open, what a wonderful opportunity to witness to people. People will ask you, what are you reading? Perfect opportunity to witness. When we give heed to what we have heard, we fill our minds with the Word of God. It's poured into us. And the thing is, if we let these things slip, it's a sign. As, as believers, we can let these things slip. But if we let them completely slip away, it may be a sign we've never known Him at all. For, he gives a warning. Fourth in verse 2, If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense and of reward, the wages of sin is death. The angels will receive judgment and God sent no redeemer for them. They received every transgression, every disobedience received a just. It's just. This is what justice is. The world has got so many misunderstandings of what justice is. Everybody have an equal amount. So all this kind of thing. Who determines what is just and right? God. And who is God? It can be seen in His moral law, the Ten Commandments. And then, as we see, what we should do, now we see why we should do it. How shall we escape? No, it says, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. How shall we escape? He keeps his covenant with those who love him with those who fear him not because they love him or sought after him be, don't be, be careful about that he, the characteristic fruit of the person he keeps covenant with is the person who loves him the person who fears him the person who seeks after him why because he's been regenerated he sought after them first not the other way around but the thing is, how should we escape? And here is the eternal consequence. If we neglect so great a salvation, if we neglect these truths, if you've been coming to church and you've never bowed the knee. See, people will make much about human ability. Otherwise, well, it's unreasonable that people be asked, the reason why a person will not come to Christ in their own strength is because they hate Him. But how shall we escape if we neglect this? His law is just. 
How shall we escape? If the justice of the angels and there was no redeemer sent for them, how shall we escape? Having heard these things, how shall we escape? If we neglect. See, the thing is, to let these things slip, we're neglecting them. To let these things fall away, we're neglecting them. Where do you escape to? Think of the foolishness of Adam and Eve as they ran from God in the garden. They ran from God. The all-knowing, all-powerful God who created that very garden and they, they felt like they could hide behind a tree. I mean... There is nowhere to run from God. Mm. Psalm 139 verse 8. Psalm 139 verse 8. Even in hell there is no escape from God. And even an understanding of hell must begin with an understanding of who God is. God hates sin. But he also hates the sinner. With, I'll read from verse 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? How shall we escape? Verse 8. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. That's a completely different thing to what the modern church is telling you. We're saying you will be separated from the eternal presence of God, God forever. And they never mention anything else. Christ is there. Christ is in hell and he's pouring out his justice upon those stiff-necked people who had never turned to him. And they've been left to their own desires of their own heart. They don't even have common grace restri restricting them anymore. If I take the winds of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. It doesn't matter where you go. You cannot escape from God. But here's the thing. We constantly try to. Always. We feel like... It's always like we're hiding things. I mean, we would hide them. It's amazing. We would hide some things we do from our best friends. But we think God can't see that. He even knows your thought processes behind that whole thing. But we think we can fool and delude God. There is nowhere to escape. Briefly look at Revelation 14. To understand the eternal consequences of neglecting so great a salvation, you must understand who this King of Righteousness is. He will come with wrath. Upon the children of disobedience. Those who never turned to him. Revelation 14. Verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine. Of the wrath of God. Which is poured out without measure. Into the cup of his indignation. Notice how it says without measure. And why? Why is hell of eternal. Of eternity. Because as David said in Psalm 51, against thee, the only, have I sinned. And because he's of infinite value, the sentence must be eternal to meet the crime. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And there's no rest day or night. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. They are they who have some sense of the eternal consequences. They know what it means if they let these things slip. But brethren, do not misunderstand me. God will prevent those from slipping completely away from Him, those who are His. Those who have been regenerated. It is by the power and His power alone. And you will never be removed from that. But here's the thing brethren. There is warnings of if you continue in my word for a reason. 
Because some pe most people who profess Christ do not continue in his word. Most people who profess Christ do it for selfish reasons. Most people who profess Christ do not come to him because of who he is. They come to him because they want the temporal benefits of what he offers. They see a Christian, oh he's cleaned up his life, I'd like some of that. That's often what it is. They want the temporal benefits, but they have sacrificed the temporal, they've, they've sacrificed the eternal, and they didn't, they didn't get either, really. Our last verse. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles and gifts of Holy Ghost, according to His own will. And listen to this. Not only has he declared his truth, not only has he spoken forth all these things, all these truths, declaring who he truly is, not only that, but bearing them witness with signs and wonders. For God, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. In all the churches of the saints. God shows, as we saw in Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 11, God is not the author of confusion. He, when he was declaring his word, these truths, it was with signs and wonders, diverse miracles. Why did he do that? To show that this was the channel. These were the channels. These were the chosen vessels of God. Doing things that only God could bring about. No parlor tricks. No jumpsuits. No fake miracles. No people having brief moments of ecstasy. Things only God could do. And we'll just finish up with the end of Mark 16. And contrary to popular reports, it does not finish at verse 9, but or verse 8. Verse 15. And he said unto them, and I believe this links in closely with that last verse, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and baptizeth shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Again, the eternal consequences, good or bad. And these signs shall follow them that believe. It didn't say they'd follow them forever. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils and shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and if... And if they drink any deadly thing... It shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That was seen with Paul in Acts 28, verse 5. Verse 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord preaching with them, and confirming the word with signs following. What a precious thing. Not only did God give his word, but he also made sure to... He's not the author of confusion. He, with signs, confirmed that these were the channels of divine truth. That there was no other possibility of error getting in. He's given us truth. Do we deserve that? No. He has given... God the Father gave His only begotten Son. He gave us His revelation. What do we do with that? And I'll leave you with this last question. Let's return to our verses again, our text verses. In Hebrews chapter 1. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation. If you're not in Christ, there's nowhere to escape to. Not in professions of religion. Not in anything. 
Not even in hell can you escape from him. He is all present, all knowing. And this is the one. He went to the cross because of our sin. It took the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb to cleanse away the filth of our sin. What do we do with that? If we see it in term, terms of if eternity, or of any kind of concept of eternity, again, a drop of water in the largest ocean you can imagine still does not bring into the vastness of eternity. These are eternal consequences. Do we take them seriously? Or do we spend so much time on the latest fad? on the latest trend. May the word guide our thoughts and our actions. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, O Lord, I thank you for your blessings, for all you give us. O Lord, may we worship your Son. May he be dear and precious to us. May we every day yearn to know more about him. May we yearn from the depths of our soul. May we cry out earnestly, not just to do enough to get by, not just to do enough to satisfy other people even in the church, but that we would do things that would earnestly and would please you. May we give earnest heed, may we meditate day and night, and may we never let these things leak out of our minds, leak out of our lives, a leak out of our hearts into backsliding. May we keep these things in mind. May the, may the trembling, oh, may godly fear fall upon us to ever do anything outside of thy will. Thank you, Lord, and I pray that you bless our conversation, bless our fellowship, and bless all that we shall receive this night. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.